Uh, hello, my name is Anthony Lilly. I'm um, Chief Executive of Magic Lantern and um, uh, a member of the content board of Ofcom, um, which uh, makes me a part-time media regulator. Uh, I was also immensely um, honoured and delighted to chair the Friends Group for, uh, for Professor now, Tanya Byron, uh, on my left, when she um, conducted the uh, review of uh, online safety that she did for the UK government recently. And um, so Graham um, and the team here um, asked if um, 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 Tanya and I would discuss, come up and sit and, and have a chat and, um, and um, um, be open to questions from you around the sort of wide topics of, of digital safety, digital literacy, and, um, and the sort of areas in which uh, Tanya, as a, as a practicing um, clinical psychologist and um, academic in this area, as well as a, a government reviewer, um, is very expert. Um, and I said to Tanya uh, on, in the cab on the way over that it would seem odd this week, um, given that Tanya has also just completed a, a stint or a sentence or whichever it is as a member of the expert panel for Lord Carter's Digital Britain review, uh, if we didn't start there, as that was uh, published this week. So, um, Tanya, there was a, an element of the foreword of the Digital Britain review and there was an element of the structure which was about digital participation and maximising digital opportunity. How, how, do you, how do you think it's played out? How do you feel about the way that the Digital Britain process has gone? Um, I just want to say, I, this, I feel this is vaguely surreal. I actually feel like we're like Peters and Lee and we <laughs> should be singing. D does this not feel really odd? I it is can't. quite odd. Yeah. We I'm also gonna, can't see you. I'm going to break into some Broadway show tunes in a minute. Um, well, Digital Britain was an interesting experience. I was the only woman on um, Lord Carter's board and I know I'm not the only woman as evidenced by the previous panel that has expertise in this area. So to begin with, that was, was quite interesting. I was also the youngest by about 75 years, which was also <laughs> extremely interesting. I wasn't able to spend a lot of time working on the Digital Britain board, so I don't want people to have an expectation that I understand the entire document. I don't. But what I, I suppose what I struggled with during, during the process was helping the plumbers think about the poetry. And for me, it was very much looking at participation and also children and young people. I advised uh, the board to have a children's panel um, sort of directly involved with, with, with the whole report. I think at the end they managed to scrape together about 11 kids that they spoke to and, 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 and wrote about that. I didn't think that was really satisfactory. But for me, I, I suppose... I, I, the report itself, my, my main thrust at the end was to get all the sort of being digital, the media literacy, the digital participation stuff taken from the last chapter and put right at the top of the report and I managed to get it put into chapter two. And that felt like a small victory for me because it really was a case of trying to convince the plumbers and the pipe builders and those who were worrying about Channel 4 and BBC Worldwide and all the other kind of big kind of media issues that actually we can spend a lot of money and a lot of time and a lot of resources building fantastic pipeways and so on and so forth but if no one knows what to do when they turn the tap on it's, a, it's, a, it's like building roads and not teaching anybody how to drive a car and certainly for me the notion of an increased opportunity does bring increased risk it brings increased benefit but it does in bring increased risk and I was concerned that there was some kind of discussion around how we think about the sort of management of people's understanding and engagement with the online space. So I was pleased that it was put up at chapter two. I was slightly displeased that it wasn't mentioned um, when, when the review came out, but I think there were much bigger sort of political and media issues that, that were focused on. And I was also pleased that finally we've got an outcome on the video games consultation process. So for me, that was a bit of a win as well. So that's the, that's the Peggy rating. Um, yes. Uh, for people who, who are not aware, when I did my review, uh, my review was on um, harmful and inappropriate content in video games and online as it comes to uh, children and young people. And it was a six-month review, which was an extraordinary short amount of time to do quite a large piece of work. And it was fascinating. And I got to meet lots of really interesting people, Anthony and a number of you in the room who it's really nice to see. Um, my review outcomes were very much built around looking at building resilience in children, young people, really looking at the education system, how we're failing young people when it comes to technology in schools, looking at schools being um, supported and pushed into a position where uh, internet and technology and sort of digital worlds are included in the curriculum, not just bolted on, and Ofsted having a greater role to play in that. And for those of you who know Sir Jim Rose's recent review about the primary curriculum, you'll know that he supported my recommendations in that. I challenged industry to actually look at setting minimum standards across the board in certain areas um, of the internet, such as 
we heard Rachel, who I, Rachel O'Connell from Bebo, who I have a huge amount of respect for and I think is somebody who really is leading in this field very much and was a great support and advisor to me during my review. But we heard Rachel talking about safety standards with social networking sites. For me, through the UK Council for Child Internet Safety, it's really about all the big, all the big players kind of joining together, setting out these minimum standards, making them transparent, let us know what the notice and takedown processes are, let us understand that, let us, let us challenge the mere conduit um, uh, law which a lot of industries are very frightened by because if they put their head above the parapet and start talking about standards will they actually compromise their own legal safety and so on and so on. I'm sure I'm speaking to people who know this a lot better than I do. But certainly, when it came to video games, a big issue fell in my lap, if you like, and the issue was um, how do we um, deal with the classification system? This wasn't an issue I was aware of before I took on the review, but it kind of came to me. And really, what was very clear to me is in six months, I didn't have the time, nor was it within the remit of the review, to set out what I thought should be a new classification system. So I set out principles, I gave an example of how it should look, and then it went to, um, it went to consultation, and the consultation period's just ended, and now government have decided that it would be an enhanced PEGI system, um, which will be the classification system, and based on the consultation, based on the fact that all my recommendations have been upheld, I think it's a great decision and I support it. But, so Digital Britain in that context, um, is it, is, has it really moved the debate on any further? Because we were talking earlier on about uh, queues of mothers standing outside computer game stores around the world to buy 18 rated titles for their 14 year old sons. What do you do about that piece of it? Is the digital participation, media literacy piece of it, is it moving quickly enough? Is it focused in the right way? Um, what, what do we change about that? I don't think it's moving quickly enough, but I, I mean, I'm quite an impatient person. But what I have to say is, what I, when I did the review, what I found when I first came into the review were some pockets of industry and, and the third sector and education, law en enforcement, some kind of pockets of stakeholders working really well together, but there were also kind of large areas of antagonism and kind of mixed ideologies and polarization of debate. By the end of the review, I don't think I necessarily made everybody into the best of friends, but I hope I created some kind of mechanism where people could come together. And I think with a kind of cross-government secretariat, because one of the things that was very clear for a number of people within the stakeholder groups was there was a huge amount of fatigue because they would go to different government departments and get different messages, which were often very conflicting, and it felt that they were swimming upstream, but there was no kind of coherent yeah. and cohesive message. Yeah. So for me, it was about building a national strategy that comes, that comes out of government, but government kind of facilitating a process for all the stakeholders to come together and to do this piece of work. The UK Council is meeting, the executive board is up and running, there are five work groups. Um, I'm broadly pleased with the work groups, although I think we've forgotten vulnerable children somewhere along the line and that's something that we have to think about. And um, unfortunately, the national strategy isn't going to be delivered as I timelined in my original review, but it's not going to be delivered hugely too late. There's one part of my recommendations that government haven't put in place, which I'm concerned about, and that was that there should be some independent person who has buy-in from the stakeholder group, who isn't attached to government, who can drive process. With respect to those who work in government, I can't think of any example of any cross-departmental organization facilitated cross-departmentally by government that's ever delivered in a timely fashion. And therefore, please have a wry chuckle if you like. And therefore, I feel that there needs to be somebody who has an ability to independently put a thrust through from the debate into the delivery um, and the output and the possible changes in policy. And that's an area, I mean, we both felt very strongly about that at the time, but for various political reasons that wasn't deemed to be the, the, the most efficient way forward at but the it, end of your review. Yeah, but it, well, I, I mean, listen, it was a recommendation in my review and I remember standing next to Gordon Brown, Jackie Smith, Andy Burnham, if you can remember. Where, where are they, they now? Where they used to be, <laughs> where they used to be, and, um, and Vernon Coker and all of them saying, this is great. Oh, and Ed Balls, of course, saying, this is great, well done, and we, we, um, we say yes to all your recommendations. I was recently asked to come back and review my review. Are you going to break news? Are you going to do that? 
no, I'm not going to come back now and re-review my review because I think it's the wrong time. I don't know what there is to review. There is a process underway that I believe is, is beginning to happen. Um, I think that people are taking it seriously and talking to each other. I think if I came in now, it would only kind of get in the way of a process that needs to find its own way. It's nothing to do with me now. It's to do with the council. It's to do with the work streams. It's to do with the, the buy-in from the different stakeholder groups. And I think that really I need to come in to support this process when there is actual tangible product for me to look at, which would be the delivery of the national strategy. Okay. So I feel it's better I wait. And when the council in itself feels it would be useful for me to come back, then I think it's better than for me to come back because government want me to so do it So in theory, if we get to next spring and the strategy's in place and they say, will you come back and tell us how to tune it, you might do it? Unless I've got something better to do, yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, just roll back to the, the digital literacy, digital participation, digital Britain thing again. Um, the various people have, in, have been writing this week and, uh, and, and, in fact, broadcasting this week that there's an awful lot in Digital Britain that's about protecting companies and copyright. And with my Ofcom hat on, I'm already engaged in suddenly potentially being involved in anti-piracy activity, things like that. There isn't terribly much about empowering, uh, terribly much detail about empowering and or protecting the individuals. And, and my, my view on, on interactive media technology is that they're all about the empowerment of individuals. Um, did that debate not happen? Did it not get heard? Or was it just overruled by the, the big status quo, the, the pipes guys, the guys from broadcasting? The debate did happen, and you, you, if you read the full 260-odd pages of the report, you, you'll find it in there. Um, I have read it. In fact, I've read a copy you gave to me of it on a plane. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> So, you, I mean, you know the debate did happen, but it didn't make, it didn't sort of, it, it wasn't what jumped out, it wasn't what was reported either by Lord Carter himself or by, or by um, the media, which is a shame, really. I mean, all the issues that you raise are issues that are dri driven by commercial imperatives, and certainly this is something that struck me in my review. I mean, child safety, I believe everybody I met in terms of stakeholder groups, you know, have have strong prevailing moral views about this and, and most people I met I felt were genuine people who felt very strongly about the issue yeah. but in terms of you know the sort of the commercial aspects of companies you can see why the uh, the spotlight would fall in other places for me really I think it, it really is about making the the digital consumer resilient and empowered and particularly I mean you know, my focus is always children and young people. They're the next generation, they're the generation coming up, they're the generation that are using technologies, they're the generation that are often quite vulnerable to the technologies they're using because they're the generation that aren't being prepared for the online world in a way that we're able to prepare our kids for the offline world because we understand it. Do you think that gets worse? I mean, if, if we have universal service broadband and we have essentially a, 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 a very large majority of the population online, young people as well as older people um, and those people are coming to this space who've not chosen to come and decide to have broadband or mobile or whatever it is and they're brought on online um, into this space and it is a much more universal activity do you think these questions of literacy and protection get more urgent do you think they get more difficult i mean is anybody really aware of the potential negative implications of suddenly everybody being there online um, it's something i talked about a lot really and um you know, at board level and, and, and sort of talked a lot about the possible implications of this, particularly, you know, as we're sort of trying to increase inclusion and participation amongst more vulnerable groups, maybe people who yeah. are denied access through socioeconomic deprivation or exclusion, people who you might say might be more vulnerable in other areas of their life and therefore need a lot of help to understand this, this, this yeah. great new kind of global world that they're stepping into. Um, I don't think it's spoken about enough. It, it's never spoken about enough. I think it's seen as being difficult to talk about because it's difficult to deliver tangibles often in, in the conversation. But actually, I think if, I mean, I remember in one board meeting talking to Stephen Carter about this and, you know, he, he, he sort of mentioned that maybe we should, whenever we think about investing in structure or plumbing or, or you know, the architecture of the system, we have to have some kind of formula that helps us then calculate what the additional cost and the necessary cost would be in terms of digital literacy, media literacy training, yeah. um, whatever you want to call it. That didn't kind of make it into the final report, which I, I know it's a kind of, it's an ideology rather than it could ever be a reality, but it's a nice thought. Is that you, it really that? Because I, mean, I, I, I said that at the Digital Britain Summit, actually, in my speech. Uh, you do it with buildings. It's called planning gain. With, when developers want permission to build enormous housing estates, 
they have to build schools and they have to build community centres and, and you have a kind of concept of how that, that idea works. It doesn't, that idea doesn't seem to, to bridge into this space at all and, 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 and I, I sort of wonder why, why that debate just doesn't seem to happen in that way. And I keep coming back, and it isn't just to just Britain, I keep coming back to the focus is on institutions and it's on legislation because the legislators are terrified of the digital generation. They don't understand the technology. They don't understand the way that these technologies are being used. So they're sort of falling back on the tools they've been used to. You set up systems, you, you, enact, you enact laws, rather than the really difficult stuff, which is supporting and changing behavior and, and, and literacy. And are we ever going to get to a shift? Do we need to get to that shift, do you think, or not? Well, I hope so. I mean, I have a lot of faith in the UK Council for Child Internet Safety. There are people in the room who are, who are very important stakeholders in that process, people who I've spoken to recently, people who gave me some advice about the review and the re-review and people whose opinion I respect. Um, you know, I've mentioned Rachel, Annie Mullins is here, Brian Leonard is here working on the video game. So there are people who I know have an absolute commitment and a focus on this. These are people who also, t you know, they speak loudly, they bang their fists on tables, yeah. but it's about whether they get heard. I think for me, strategically, the point at which I come back in is the point at which I want to say you're not listening to these people now. And, and I think it's not quite at this moment, but it will come. But I think it's, it's, a very easy, it, it's very easy to, to overlook this piece that we're talking about, but it's very dangerous to overlook it as well. And certainly, currently, I'm doing a lot of work thinking at a policy level about schools, and it, it kind of horrifies me how schools have absolutely no idea, absolutely no idea, most schools, how to cope with technology and young people. They're locking computer rooms during break time. Um, they're, they're chasing kids around who are looking at all sorts of things on, you know, user-generated content sites that they don't want them to look at. Most schools don't have an acceptable use policy. Most schools don't have a digital council. A number of teachers don't know how to use digital technology in terms of the classroom and teaching. A lot of teachers feel very anxious about kids bringing laptops into the classroom. This morning I was at a conference and I shared a platform with Sue Palmer who wrote a book called Toxic Childhood, some of you might have read. So it was an interesting book talking about childhood and children, but it was a scaremongering book. It was a, it's all going to hell in a handcart and computers and the, you know, media are sort of partly responsible for that. And I suggested to her that actually, just because we didn't grow up with it, we don't understand it, doesn't mean to say that it doesn't have a huge amount of benefit and opportunity. And there are ways in which we can harness it that will be empowering for the next generation because quite frankly, they're doing it anyway. Yeah. But when you stand with kind of influential people who have loud voices, who say things like, no computer in a classroom till a child is eight years old, I kind of throw my head in my hands and think, by the time they're eight, they're building their own website. It's, you know, it's too late. Um, but I, I, so still, there is this kind of, I mean, the question for me is, how do you sell this stuff into people who don't know they need to know it, i.e. parents and some teachers? How do you get past the kind of Luddites and those who go back to the halcyon days of reading and writing and try and help them understand that actually video gaming can have educational benefits? Children with learning difficulties, for example, one of my children who's dyslexic learned to read by video gaming. Great couldn't sit down and read a book with me, couldn't track it. It was a real problem for him. Video gaming, absolutely. He was map reading, he was learning to read, and so on. But how can you sell that message in when there is such a pre prevailing moral panic? We still have media scare story headlines. We still have all the kind of finger pointing to industry, the media industry and the video games industry saying you are responsible for the, you know, the, the broken Britain, the yob culture, and the fact that kids are knifing each other. Until we move away from that very narrow overly paranoid, risk-averse perspective, I'm not sure how we get these messages understood and thought about in a way that's proportionate, balanced, and makes a difference. Do you think the opposite is also true, though? Do you think technology industries are at least as, com uh, as guilty of overplaying the benefits and overselling the vision and sort of using... and, and sort of denigrating people who aren't necessarily picking up those technologies quickly? Um, is there too much hype and too much boost about some of the technology? And actually there is a, just a real world in between the scaremongering and the everybody must have the new, newest thing view of the world. I, mean, will this, I suppose another way of saying that is when this generation that didn't grow up with this stuff has passed as parents, will the next generation just have parenting problems, some of which are digital, and they'll be just practical everyday problems? Or will there still be these extreme swings, do you think? Well, I think, you know, if you look back in history, and I wrote about this a bit in my review, when, when the printing pre press was first designed with Caxton, the words went on the page, everybody freaked out. It was the end of society. The church yeah. fell apart because information was now being democratized and sent out to people without their control. 
you know, there's a lot of kind of evidence that when the waltz was first introduced into Europe, it was seen to be the mechanism by which young women would become riddled with syphilis and would become prostitutes. This was the waltz, the dance. The telephone was debated in, in, in the Houses of Parliament as being something that maybe women should have some restriction on their use of it because it might make them, you know, less good mothers. Well, maybe it has, I don't know. But the, <laughs> I don't know, I'll ask my kids. Well, I'll phone my kids and ask them, obviously. Text them. Because I never see them. No, you um, normally text them. Yeah. Um, but, but I suppose the point is this, is that... Um, well, well, I mean, who knew social networking three years ago? I mean, you know, things come and they kind of burst. D does industry overhype it? And ex I, I think it is exciting. I think it's really exciting. I think, you know, I just watch what my kids can do and how they can learn, particularly my child who has a learning difficulty. And I'm, I'm thankful for technology and I'm thankful for the fact that their projects can be, can be kind of delivered in a way that I could never dream of doing when I was a child. This is all really good, but alongside that comes risk. We just have to be sensible about it. You know, we know how to parent our, and educate our kids for the offline world. We should do it for the online world. I just want to kind of pause here and just make a point if that's all right. I yeah. think for me, there's a kind of, there's a much bigger piece here, which is about we live in a risk-averse society, in a risk-averse culture. We take a zero risk approach to parenting and educating children. I mean, we're all kind of oldish in the room. So, you know, when we were kids, we would play out on our bikes. You know, kids can't play conkers anymore in most schools without wearing goggles. They're not allowed to throw snowballs and they're not allowed to climb trees. Teachers are not allowed to put sun cream on kids because they're not allowed to touch their bodies. They're not allowed to wipe their bums. I mean, you know, we've become such a kind of predator-fearing society that children are being raised in captivity. And just to kind of make the point here, if you don't mind, because it's the end of the day and I'm getting quite bored with my own voice anyway, can you just think about the, um, the favorite place for you, each of you, and forgive me for those of you who I've done this with before, but when you were a child, your favorite place to play, just think where it was, and then stand up if you, um, if you the place that you're thinking of was outside, please. Oh, and me too. Yes. So. Right, okay. That's well, more or less everybody. That's pretty much everybody, okay. Okay, okay. thank you. It's got you woken up a bit, hey? Hello, I'm, I'm Tanya Byron, just in case you've been sleeping for the this last is, 20 this minutes. Is, yeah, this, this is, is Tanya it. Byron's calisthenics course. Yes. You don't know this exists until now. Um, now, could you stand up if it was outside of the direct supervision of adults, please? Yes, same, same, same. Good. Now, if we had a room full of young children, and, uh, particularly children and sort of older children um, here, I don't think most of them would have stood up to either of those questions because children do not have the same freedoms that we have. They are not given the same freedoms to develop as children. So with some sense of irony, what we're doing is we're raising our children in captivity because we have this skewed belief that there are predators on every street corner. And therefore, by doing that, our children are having to live their childhood indoors. And living their childhood indoors, they're living their childhood online. And so online, they're doing what you need to do as a child, because it's in your job description, which is fundamentally take risks, have a laugh, communicate, play games, be a bit naughty, say a few rude words, maybe show your willy to someone if you can get away with it, and those kinds of things. Stuff that most of us, if we're kind of normal, would have done, well, I obviously don't have a willy, but would have done, <laughs> sort of. Quite a lot of us would do it tonight if we could get away with it. <laughs> Thank you. Um, as children. Now, if you kind of think about the irony fixed onto that then is here, and I found this a lot in my review, a lot of parents would say, you know, well, when they're, when they're, when they're at home and they're watching telly and they're online, I know they're safe. When you say to a lot of people, actually, when they're online, they're going through a web browser, the web browser is the same as your front door. How old is your kid when you let them through the front door on their own? It's when you know they're independent. You've taught them how to cross the road, how to climb trees and fall out cleverly and all that kind of stuff. By the way, new A&E statistics show that there is an increasing number of children who are coming into A&E now with broken limbs because they don't know how to fall. And another interesting kind of fact, if you go to a boring dinner party this weekend, is the Royal Society, um, the RSA, or is it ROSPA? can't Rosper. remember, ROSPA. Yeah. Um, the, the recent stat is that six times as many children are killed every year by being crushed by large televisions than in playgrounds outdoors. So here we have children being raised in captivity, hypothetically, to keep them safe. They're going online to a global playground, not a local playground or the street outside their home, but a global playground where no parent or teacher has said to them, don't give your details out to strangers. What about your privacy settings on your social networking site? What are you going to do if one of your friends wants to talk to you about cutting? You know, what do you feel about the fact that someone might ask you for, their, for your details because they've got a really exciting product they want to sell you? So we're not giving our children safety messages for the area that they need to be safe, the area that we're placing them in because we're worried about them being safe in the area that actually we're probably giving them more safety messages for. 
it's, it's a big piece. And how do you sell into people who don't understand that, the fact that they do have to understand that? Yeah. And, that's, and that's the, I suppose that's the that's the, big, that's the big challenge. I, think, I agree with you. That's the big challenge. Um, we've got five or six minutes. If there are questions or comments or anything from the floor um, that you'd um, like to contribute. I don't know if we have a, a roving mic or anything, but anybody, um, anybody got anything they'd like to ask? Um, Tanya? Um, or, uh, yes, we have a hand. I can see a hand. I don't know who it is, I'm afraid. Um, but if we can get your microphone, that would be wonderful. There we go, one microphone coming in. Thank you. In your report, you made the comment, you used the analogy of swimming pools. Yeah. The analogy of putting up a sign was not good enough, that in fact you actually had to teach people how to swim. But uh, the analogy, it seems to me, was rather weak because when Learn to Swim classes took off, you actually had to show you could swim. And most of your report and most of what's been put in place in England is about teaching people to swim not actually testing whether they can swim before they're allowed to swim. And that's a totally different concept. In other words, yours is not outcomes-based, it's inputs-based. I think that's a really good point. I think certainly something that's kind of come out much more from the education angle, the, 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 the part of my report when I talk, where I talk about education in schools, is very much also about looking at um, what, people, what children can do already. So there is a sense not just of taking every child as if they don't know what they're doing, but actually school, for, for Ofsted to go into schools and not only look at the schools, but look at the children within the school and look at what they are already doing. Um, I probably, it was probably buried in the report rather than put up in the front as I did with the swimming pool analogy. The swimming pool analogy, for those of you who haven't read it, was exactly as the gentleman said. It's about, it's about, I was trying to kind of find a way of describing it that would be understandable to most people, which is if we look at a place of, of opportunity but also risk, if we think about swimming pools, yes, we have, to have a, we have to have a kind of area that has signs saying don't do this, don't run, don't pet or whatever it used to say when we were kids, uh, you know, no diving in the shallow end and, and, and so on. We have to have lifeguards like we have moderators saying out you get if you don't behave, all that kind of stuff. But my point was we also need to teach children how to swim in terms of we need to enable them to know what to do if they fall into the the water and we're not there, that they can actually get to the edge and they know what to do if they're, if, if they're in those waters. And actually, some kids, we teach them to swim from the beginning, some kids, we help them to swim better than they can already swim. So for me, if you take what the swimming pool analogy and place it within the part of the report around education, you'll see that it is also built around outcome and an understanding of what children can already do. And using what children can already do and what they tell us to inform us better on how we can further support them so it's not just a top-down approach. Do you think um, the Rose Review and the, ICT, the, the inclusion of ICT competency in the curriculum is, is going in that direction? Is it, is it starting to test and starting to bring more formality? Will they get to that place or will it be how to click a mouse? Well, I think, I think it's the intention, but I'm, I'm, really, fasc I'm really interested by, by the question that was just asked because I think actually in the kind of the nuancing and the interpretation of what's being said, for example, in my review and in also the Rose review, I think you're right to point out that it can look very input driven and actually we're forgetting that we have to look at outcomes and we have to look at competency. Yeah. And my concern from the Rose review and probably some of what was written in my review was that it looks like these are things that you bolt in and you put in, that you bolt on and you put in without taking account of whatever is going on. But I think the ongoing debate and, what, and the discussions in the UK Council, I think, will be addressing these things. But I, and I hope that, that you know, this kind of debate will allow people to think beyond that. So thank you for your comment. Indeed, thank you. Uh, we've probably got time for one more. Have we got, yeah, we've got time for one more. Has a hand just gone shooting up immediately <laughs> alongside? Thanks. Um, Gillian Pitt from Consumer Focus. I, I work in the disadvantaged team then where we're predominantly uh, interested in those children who can't actually afford to get onto the internet in the first place. But my question is around the Digital Britain report that the Digital Inclusion Champion was announced at the same time the report was launched. And um, I wondered what Tanya thought about her role in, in actually bridging the gap between digital inclusion issues and the evolving Digital Britain uh, debate and strategy that will be ongoing. I know Martha Lane Fox, and I think she's an excellent woman. She's an incredibly bright woman. She's a survivor, as we all know, um, in the most extraordinary way. And um, I think it was, a, it, was, it was a good choice. 
but I have no idea how to answer the rest of your question. I'm not even clear what her role is. Uh, I'm not sure that she's that clear what her role is. I think it's one of those things where here is a role, now fill it, in the same way as I experienced when I worked for government, which is here is a review, now do it. Uh, I think she's still very much thinking about the terms of reference of her role and how that is going to she's going to operationalize that and that's going to translate. So I think the best person to ask actually is Martha Lane Martha. Fox, but I don't think she'd probably be able to answer you yet. I think she's too busy thinking about it. But I think if anybody's going to think kind of in a common sense and strategic way, I think it's her and I think she's definitely a good choice. I'm sorry I can't be more specific. Well, look, it's Friday afternoon. It is now nearly quarter to five, and uh, that means we've run more or less time on our session and <laughs> caught you more or less up. Um, um, thank you very much, Professor Tanya Byron. <laughs> it's always lovely to spend time with you. Thank uh, you very much, Professor uh, Anthony Lilly. Professor Anthony Lilly, all that, yeah. And thank you very much for inviting us, Graham. A, a fabulous double act. Thank you very much, both of you.